Welcome to the African International Mediation Week. Today is the third day of December in the year 2020. And this is the fourth day of the African International Mediation Week and Strategy Conference. My name is Wangari Kabiru. I am the convener of Wasili Anahab and the facilitator of today's session, an international seminar on financial industry dispute resolution. We're hosted together with the Financial Industry Disputes Resolution Center, that is FIDREC in Singapore. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this session. Thank you. Uh, welcome today. Today is the third day of December in the year 2020 and welcome to the African International Mediation Week. And this is the fourth day of the African International Mediation Week and uh, Strategy 20 Conference, which is hosted uh, by Wasiliana Hub and the Uganda West Nile Mediation Center with uh, collaborating partners, the Coast Mediation uh, Center, the Cal Mediation and Arbitration Center, and the Suluhu Mediation Center based in Nakuru. Today, we have an international seminar on the financial industry dispute resolution. And uh, this is hosted with the Financial Industry Dispute Resolution Center that is FIDREC in Singapore. Our topic today is, is Kenya ready for an independent, industry independent financial industry dispute resolution center? My name is Wangari Kabiru and I will be the facilitator for this session today. Our speaker today, international speaker is Ms. Eunice Chua, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Financial Industry Disputes Resolution Center, Singapore. The way we will run our session today is we will receive opening remarks from Eric Theuri, who is the chairman of the Law Society of Kenya, that is the LSK Nairobi branch. Then after that, we will listen to our uh, international speaker today, Ms. Eunice Chua, give us a presentation on the Financial Industry Disputes Resolution Center, Singapore. Then after that, we will have a discussion and contributions. I welcome you to this discussion. The session today will enable mediation practitioners and industry stakeholders to explore approaches and structures for creating more joyful experiences in accessing financial services. The Financial Disputes Resolution Center model of mediation in Singapore will be presented. Practitioners in Africa will explore how to serve the local consumer markets and the unique in-country design. So our objectives of today is to be able to qualify the nature of and value, that is the quality and the quantity of industry specific disputes and experiences to also transform the financial services industry strategy towards the micro, small and medium enterprises and consumer related disputes. And sadly, to give more joyful experiences in access to financial services in Kenya and also offer a model for Africa. So I welcome you once again, and we will start off with the words of the Kenyan national anthem in Kiswahili, Wimbo Wataifa. E mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwengao na mlinzi, na tukai na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha tupate na ustawi. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Karibuni Sana. Miss Eunice Chua, good morning to you and good afternoon to uh, where you are today. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon us. and good morning. <laughs> it's good to hear you. So I invite uh, Mr. Eric Theuri, the chairman of the Law Society of Kenya, Nairobi branch, for his opening remarks to this uh, international seminar today. Good morning, Mr. Eric Theuri. Good morning to you, Angari, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very, very uh, topical discussion. And uh, Mr. Eunice Chua, good, uh, is it good afternoon? Yes. All right, uh, we are still getting used to the new normal that, uh, and adjusting to the different time zones, but thank you so much also for joining us and we are looking forward to the presentation that uh, you're going to make. Uh, is Kenya ready for an industry independent financial dispute resolution center? That is a very, very interesting uh, topic and perhaps it can get answers either way, either, either yes or a no, but I think we want to look at it and explore 
first of all, try to understand how it works. And uh, I think uh, yeah, Eunice will basically be uh, looking at you to understand how the, the model works in Singapore. And uh, uh, so that, you know, we do not have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, and uh, probably learn from your experiences. Uh, the other day, the, the Chief Justice launched uh, what uh, we call the State of the Judiciary Report. And from it, we had very, very interesting uh, statistics on, uh, uh, with, with regard to mediation. And, uh, you know, we have the, what we have in Kenya right now is the court annexed mediation so that it is disputes that are in court that have been filed in court that are then sieved by the court and referred to uh, mediation. And uh, we have primarily disputes in the commercial division, which uh, most of the time involve disputes between banks uh, or financial institutions and their customers and then disputes in the, in, in the family sector. And uh, of the, so generally speaking, uh, about 2,900 cases have been referred to mediation. And uh, worth the, to the worth of, of those cases is about 333.9 billion, uh, that is in Kenyan shillings. And about 900 of those cases have been, uh, have been, uh, have been cleared and uh, releasing uh, the equivalent of about uh, uh, 6.9 billion. And, and so that in, it starts to give you a sense of uh, the kind of successes uh, we can get when you uh, refer disputes to uh, mediation. But what are the challenges that we have with mediation in Kenya is that first, uh, we do not have a law that anchors mediation per, uh, per se, uh, as opposed to, for example, uh, arbitration. And, and uh, in as much as uh, the Kenyan constitution encourages uh, the judiciary to then use alternative dispute resolution methods, and that's, that's the underpinning, uh, the, the, the clause that underpins the court annexed mediation, uh, the lack of uh, sector uh, uh, um, legislation that anchors mediation is, 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 is a challenge. And so we, we have now uh, a mediation bill that has been drafted, uh, which then seeks to answer certain questions in terms of uh, standardization. How do you standardize uh, uh, um, the question of uh, recognition of uh, uh, the mediators, uh, accreditation of mediators, enforcement of uh, 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 mediation uh, settlement agreements, because as 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 it is the because of course it is caught annexed. So whenever there is a, 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 a um, and a mediation settlement, then it has to be it will be registered in court. But where mediation then is not anchored on uh, the court annexed mediation, it becomes a problem because the, the, the process of enforcement is not so clear because it has not been set out in, uh, in, in statute. And, and, and I, I think those are now like some of what you would consider some, somehow structural uh, challenges to, to mediation, but those I think would be answered uh, if then the uh, law is, is enacted. Of course, as, as a country, we are keen to, and we've been working hard to improve our indexes on the ease of doing business. And uh, the, there's no, uh, of course, uh, there's been a lot of uh, focus in trying to reduce the turnaround time uh, for settling cases. Uh, uh, for quite some time, the preferred route for settling uh, commercial disputes was uh, arbitration until arbitration ended up looking again like uh, the court process. And uh, the, 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 of course, mediation also um, is more akin to a court process and the, the advantages that accrue through uh, mediation where it is uh, uh, 
the parties themselves engaging and uh, discussing and reaching an agreement as opposed to where uh, somebody else makes that decision, be it an arbitrator or be it a court, you know, that advantage uh, um, uh, ends up getting lost. And so when we are looking at uh, the financial sector, you, you find that um, uh, there is always the need sometimes to create or to maintain uh, a, a good working relationship. For example, uh, uh, you could find that there is a, a dispute between a, a financial institution and a client, a long-standing client who's had a, a good working relationship with a, a financial institution. But in the event of uh, a breakdown in that relationship, perhaps just because of one, uh, of one transaction, uh, and then it ends up in litigation, you, you find that that long-standing relationship can end up uh, 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 losing uh, the trust that it has it had developed because uh, either going to court or going through arbitration is more of a more is a, is a really a process that, that, that can, can can break those relationships. And so I, I think uh, mediation and in, in, in financial and uh, in, 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 uh, resolving financial disputes uh, can be, can have more wins than, uh, than going through uh, the court process. But the, the question then would be, and then that is what is, is even in the, in, 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 in the discussion that we are having, we are speaking of an industry independent so uh, the, 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 the question would be then which industry and how independent is it? So uh, I, I guess maybe we may want to, to, to learn from your end because uh, there is always the feeling that, you know, he who pays the piper then calls uh, uh, the tune. And so uh, who, who will uh, anchor this independence? Uh, and, and, and you know, uh, me, me, mediation uh, and uh, mediators come from different and diverse fields. They are lawyers, they are counselors, they are teachers. And so it, it is quite diverse and, and you're bringing in a, a diverse mix of professionals. So when we're speaking about independence and, uh, and industry, then are we talking about uh, uh, the financial industry or are we talking about uh, the mediation industry? Are we talking about the legal profession? So that uh, sort of who will host, where it will be housed might be an issue and perhaps we may learn a lot uh, with uh, what is happening in other countries. The other obvious issue, and which is what as a branch, uh, as a law society branch, we are also keen to look at this, is there is a shrinking, uh, we, there is a need to expand the areas in which our advocates can get work. Uh, uh, our members can get work and, and employ their skills. And, and for me, mediation uh, is uh, 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 such an area. It, it has great potential for uh, creating employment, uh, unlocking disputes, improving uh, as a country, our ease of doing business, because the, 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 the more we are able to attract business, the more then the lawyers are able to get uh, work because lawyers then are the, the, the you know, uh, the engineers, so to speak, of commercial transactions. And so uh, the more you are able to attract investment, then the more, uh, we have work and uh, of course uh, that also comes with disputes and then it nationally translates into more work. So uh, we, we are quite uh, excited to host this discussion because we see great potential for, 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 for us as a profession and uh, for, for, for us as a, as, as a country. And, um, and um, uh, so, uh, those are the issues which we'll be looking at uh, in terms of, uh, of course, the, the, the Wangari was speaking about, uh, I think, quantity, value. So, of course, th there are all those issues. But again, the issue of quality, 
the other issue which of course comes out a lot is that uh, when it comes to, for example, if the dispute is about, uh, um, about uh, interest rates, for example, you, you would find that um, uh, that, unless then you take it to uh, industry players that uh, have expertise in uh, calculating interest rates so that then they are able to challenge what the bank gives you. Uh, and that is through a court process. Some, uh, you would find that uh, uh, if you have a client who is unable to afford, because they can be quite pricey, if you have a client who is unable to afford, you might not be able to uh, uh, challenge a bank effectively on those rates when it comes to computation, because they are also other, um, it, it's an area in which may re require a little bit of uh, uh, expertise to, to, to unravel. And, and so we, I, I see mediation as giving us that opportunity to be able then to have the party sitting and then getting uh, easily agreeing that let us get someone who comes and looks at this and tells us no, this rate of interest rate, the compounding or whatever didn't, and the penalty clauses have not been done according to uh, the in industry agreed uh, uh, standards. And so uh, th there's a lot of uh, uh, potential for, for, for this. And I think this is a timely discussion uh, and building on uh, the discussions that can come out of this, we can be able to uh, uh, progress this discussion and, and try and see if, whether as a country, we are ready for, for, for mediation in the, in, uh, in, in the financial uh, industry. So uh, uh, there is an element of, yes, we are ready. There is an element of, no, we are not ready. We have a lot of uh, challenges. So I, 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 I wouldn't want to uh, give a verdict because the jury is out there, but uh, Eunice, we hope that uh, you will, uh, uh, and, 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 and the other discussions that uh, we are going then to uh, try and chew on this meet and try and see if, uh, if it is something that we can be able to digest. So uh, Wangari, thank you so much for inviting me to give this uh, opening uh, remarks. Unfortunately, because of other prior engagements, I may not be able to sit all through the entire presentations, but I will be following up on this. Uh, and look for the recordings to just see uh, what uh, uh, resolutions or what uh, um, uh, key highlights will come out of this uh, uh, discussion. So thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Eric Theory, for your uh, opening remarks message. And um, I wish to say that uh, you've left us in uh, quagmire. And I think that's why you, uh, yeah, you said it yet again and again that uh, probably that's why Eunice is here. Because yes, you say, okay, maybe, yes, no. And okay, so uh, even if it is, so which industry? Because I mean, they, they are diverse professions or, or, and also stakeholders. Again, you also raised, so who's paying for this? You know, who will, yeah, who will hold this foundation? Um, uh, in addition to that, um, something I think that's also very important, you pointed out that it's important that Kenya provides a more conducive environment for uh, business, which yet uh, now for on, uh, when it comes like to the, uh, to the law society, the Nairobi branch, then that makes it um, uh, increases the opportunity for work for your members. Um, and uh, also at the same time, you pointed out that um, you're keen on um, unlocking new areas and mediation is one of the areas or unlocking uh, more areas for um, your members to practice. Um, at the same time, something I think that's also very important and it could be interesting to hear from Eunice is also how uh, whatever model it is works with um, probably other advisors because this is not a very straightforward um, industry. And something else that you raise within that context also is the element of the consumers, the consumers capacity in themselves, either as individuals or even as um, um, enterprises. And so Eunice, I think uh, you have a very good opening to be able to uh, pick up from and um, carry uh, and carry on from. So thank you very much, uh, Eric uh, Eric Theory. 
Eric Teuri is the chairman of the Law Society of Kenya, the Nairobi branch. So Eunice Chua, we will now give you the opportunity. Eunice Chua is the chief executive officer, the financial industry dispute resolution center in Singapore. You can be sure we are all ears today. Thank you. Karibu Eunice, Thank you. welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ankari, and thank you, Eric, for the opening remarks. I'm very honoured to be invited to share with you some perspectives from Singapore. I'm very glad that we have this chance to engage with each other, although we are physically um, you know, far removed. So I've prepared a set of slides that um, uh, outlines what FIDREC uh, is about, how we were set up, and I hope that this will you know, provide some good insights. And I also look forward to you know, responding to your questions and also discussing the points that you are particularly interested in. So just to give you an overview and to introduce FIDREC, we were officially launched in August 2005. So this year would be our 15th anniversary year. We were set up to be independent, impartial, and affordable. So these were part of our key founding principles. Uh, and Eric, you asked about how independent can you know, an organization really be? Is it dependent on the funders of the organization? I'll share a bit more about this uh, later when I explain how we were set up. But yes, this is something that is um, a persistent issue that will not go away, I'm sure. Um, we specialize in handling disputes between consumers and financial institutions through the modes of mediation and adjudication. So we've used mediation as the first step because ideally there can be an amicable resolution, but we also provide adjudication so that there is some finality um, to our process. We are designated by the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is our central bank, um, as a designated dispute resolution scheme. So under the Monetary Authority of Singapore dispute resolution schemes regulations, all licensed financial institutions in Singapore who have a retail uh, presence must be registered with a designated dispute resolution scheme. And so far, FIDREC is the sole such scheme in Singapore. So hence, we will handle all the um, financial institutions' disputes with consumers in Singapore. Before we take in a complaint, though, we do require that the complainant must have first approach their institution directly to try and resolve the dispute at that level. So this gives the financial institution a chance to you know, resolve the matter without uh, FIDREC's intervention. Uh, it builds trust right, so that the institutions know that FIDREC will only come in right, at an appropriate stage. So we give them four weeks. So if within four weeks there is no satisfactory resolution or there's no response, the consumer can then bring their case to FIDREC. And what happens when the case arrives at FIDREC? Uh, it arrives in the form of a dispute resolution form. It signifies the start of a case at FIDREC. And at this part, we will alert the consumer as to the privacy and confidentiality of this process. And this is also an important hallmark of our process that has allowed the financial institutions to trust us with their disputes as well, because one of the big risks for financial institutions is a reputational risk, right? And this also affects the overall stability of the financial sector if there are numerous disputes filed in court. So privacy and confidentiality, I would say, is quite a key hallmark of our process. After we receive the dispute resolution form, we do a case review where we look into the dispute to see whether it comes within our jurisdiction. So our jurisdiction is set up quite clearly in a document that we call the Terms of Reference. And this uh, essentially gives um, FIDREC the power to consider various kinds of disputes but not others. So just some examples of disputes we do not handle would be disputes that are under police investigation, for example. So for these types of disputes, it would be more suitable if they are fully investigated. We also do not handle disputes where a court order has already been made. So these are just some examples. If the case is within our jurisdiction, so we have checked that the complainant is a consumer. So we only handle cases from 
individual consumers or sole proprietor. The consumer is indeed a customer of the financial institution, right? And their dispute concerns uh, their financial relationship. So not all disputes between consumers and their financial institution. So for example, if you, you know, trip and fall on the premises of a bank, um, you know, you want to sue the bank for negligence uh, in their design of their premises and so on. That is not the type of dispute Pidjack handles. So we only handle uh, disputes arising from the customer relationship uh, with the bank. So if this dispute is within our jurisdiction, it progresses to mediation, where our case managers will facilitate discussions to see whether there can be an amicable resolution. Um, we have used various modes even before COVID-19. Um, we have used the telephone, uh, email, uh, as well as face-to-face um, -face meetings to conduct these mediation sessions. If the case is not settled at mediation, we then offer the consumer the opportunity to proceed with adjudication. We have an external panel of adjudicators. So unlike our mediators who are all full-time staff at FIDREC and trained by FIDREC, the adjudicators are you know, kind of independent from us. They are uh, external, retired judges, senior lawyers, retired industry professionals. Um, they are the ones who um, decide on the case. And we think this is important because at least it provides a distinction between the mediation process and the adjudication process. You can imagine that uh, if you knew your mediator would somehow be able to influence uh, the decision maker, right, the adjudicator, if they were colleagues, for instance, you might be a bit more careful in what you are willing to share in the mediation session. So that is why our adjudication process is quite distinct and we do not utilize um, FIDREC staff members generally uh, for the adjudication. And finally, um, after the adjudication process where all the parties will get a chance to be heard and present their case, call witnesses, um, the adjudicator will prepare a grounds of decision and this uh, will be read out to the consumer and the financial institution. So very similar to the ombudsman models in other jurisdictions like the UK and like Australia, um, the decision is only binding on the financial institution. The consumer has a choice whether to accept it or not. Uh, and what gives us this ability to bind the financial institution is our uh, subscriber relationship Right? The financial institutions have to be our subscribers and members. And as part of that, they agree to be bound by um, the decisions of the adjudicators. So this gives our decisions teeth. Yeah? But after the decision is made, if the consumer chooses not to accept the award, then of course um, the process ends. The consumer is free to go elsewhere if he or she wishes to pursue the matter further. But this concludes the FIDREC process. If the consumer chooses to accept the award, then the consumer and the financial institution enter into a separate agreement in the terms of the award. And this is where FIDREC is a bit more unique and different from other financial ombudsman institutions where the decision itself um, has that binding effect. Um, and that is because uh, in quite a uniquely Singaporean way, um, we were set up as an alternative dispute resolution provider. Right? not as a decision-making body per se. So whatever outcomes at FIDREC have to be consensual. Yeah? So that's why, even, that's why this adjudication can actually be seen more of, um, from the consumer's perspective at least, like a non-binding evaluation. Right? He or she can choose to accept uh, if she wants or doesn't want to. Yeah? Okay, so that um, explains the overall process at FIDREC. And now I'll just explain our schemes. We have two main schemes. Um, one is the general dispute resolution scheme. We do not impose any limits for mediation, but for adjudication, there is a limit of $100,000 per claim. And the rationale for this limit, of course, is that FIDREC was set up to cater to a lower value disputes, right? So those that would not be effectively dealt with in the courts or might not be cost effective um, to bring to the courts, um, we have this platform. At mediation, it is free for the consumer. Uh, we only charge the financial institution a small sum of $50. Uh, GST is our goods and services tax. And adjudication, we charge the consumer a nominal fee of $50. Uh, 
uh, this is to help the consumer to appreciate that to go to the next phase of adjudication, they should consider their steps and you know their options carefully before proceeding. Uh, we note that many jurisdictions have the process completely free for consumer, whether mediation or adjudication. And again, this is where FIDREC is a little bit more unique. We also have a separate non-injury motor accident scheme, and this scheme was established uh, in consultation with the courts in Singapore, where they wish to um, have lower value disputes come to FIDREC before they go to the courts. So there is actually a pre-action protocol for non-injury motor accident cases, whereby claims below $3,000 should be first brought to FIDREC, otherwise there could be potential cost consequences. Um, the charging fee uh, is similar for mediation, still free for the consumer. Um, the financial institution pays $50. Uh, the difference is that there is an additional step of a mediator's indication for the non-injury motor accident scheme. And this is on request of the courts, and it is to mirror um, the court's uh, own uh, mediation schemes where if the mediation fails you have a separate individual give an indication this indication is non-binding so both parties can choose to accept or not accept and this gives yet another opportunity for settlement before the case goes to adjudication um, similar to the general dispute resolution scheme, uh, adjudication represents the final step of the FIDREC process. Um, there is a difference in the charging model here um, because there was a lot of concern from the financial institutions that if they were made to pay $500 you know, in any event, um, this would force them essentially to settle claims lower than $500. And given that the scheme is catered for low value claims of below $3,000, um, this was a compromise, right? Where both the consumer and the financial institution will pay um, you know, their respective amounts, but a refund may be given uh, to the winning party. Okay, now to give an overview of the kind of case load that we handle, um, our financial year runs from July to June. So in the recently concluded uh, financial year, we handled 7,000 over enquiries and 1,227 claims. The difference between enquiries and claims are that enquiries can be very general relating to you know, various aspects of our services, whether or not the consumer should bring a claim, um, whereas a claim is a crystallized complaint, right? There's an actual claim being brought. You would see that most of the claims have been brought against the banks and finance companies. This is the big orange chunk. And next would be life insurers followed by general insurers. Um, this year is a bit more unique where we have general insurers at 20%. Generally, they are a bit lower. But because of uh, COVID-19, there were a lot of travel insurance related claims. And this uh, caused a bigger proportion of uh, general insurance claims at FITREC. The kinds of uh, financial products that are most frequently involved uh, in disputes would be life insurance products. This is the grey chunk on the screen, followed by consumer and personal finance products, which could be, for example, credit cards, debit cards, your um, deposit accounts, your current accounts, and so on. Investments uh, would be your equities, your bonds, and so forth, and general insurance, um, you know, travel insurance, motor insurance, uh, and other types of short-term insurance. The nature of the claims that we handle mostly have to do with the practice and policies of the financial institutions, in particular, whether or not um, an insurer is liable to pay out a certain claim and market conduct. And market conduct here, we refer to a group of uh, conduct that uh, includes misrepresentation on the part of the financial advisor, a mis-selling of a product, meaning that an unsuitable product that did not meet the client's risk profile and needs was um, sold and recommended, uh, as well as uh, inadequate disclosure, because the uh, central bank, of course, has regulations as to what should be disclosed to consumers, and if there is any gap there, uh, this is again room for dispute. Service standards and others are also frequent complaints and others, the most common type of um, complaint pertains to unauthorized transactions or fraud, right? where the consumer is defrauded um, and now tries to claim back against the financial institution. 
So next is the outcomes. You would see that um, if you combine the orange and the grey chunk, that is about 81% uh, of cases that we can close at the mediation stage. However, not all the cases we close at mediation actually results in a settlement agreement. So in the last financial year, about 42%, right, there was a settlement agreement and the remaining 39%, there was no settlement agreement. Um, and there can be many reasons why, even though there is no settlement, a consumer doesn't proceed with adjudication. For example, if they you know, learn more during the process of mediation and they understand why the financial institution cannot help them and they give up the case for that reason. Um, for the cases that do proceed with adjudication, this is a smaller proportion. It is about 20%. And you would see that uh, most of these claims, there is no award, meaning that the consumer um, is not granted any um, remedy. Now, let me just tell a bit of the story uh, behind FIDREC because I can tell that there is a lot of interest in you know, the establishment of a body like us. Um, I would say that the story started in 2004. At that time, the financial institutions were not uh, kind of all consolidated. They didn't consolidate their dispute resolution services. So the banks, they had a consumer mediation unit under the Association of Banks in Singapore. And for insurers, they had a separate insurance dispute resolution organization. So what happened in 2004 was um, the capital market services providers, they got together and they realized that they also needed a dispute resolution scheme for consumers, but they thought that it wouldn't be cost effective to set up yet another scheme. So in consultation with the central bank, um, all the key players got together and an integration steering committee was established with the aim of integrating all the dispute resolution schemes into one to provide a one-stop shop, essentially, for the consumers um, to be able to access a dispute resolution service. There was a public consultation on this. All the financial institutions through their industry associations were actively consulted. And then <laughs> FIDREC was established in 2005. So I think one very key lesson is you do need um, the buy-in of all your key stakeholders in order to succeed. The legislation actually came a bit later <laughs> in 2007 because that took time to get through the parliamentary process. Um, but really the key here is once if you have everyone's buy-in and agreement, the legislation becomes secondary. So 2008 saw the establishment of the FIDREC NEMA scheme and also the global financial crisis hit. And this was where FIDREC faced um, you know, a sudden surge in its caseload. We handled uh, more than uh, 2,000 over cases within a very short span of time uh, related to the collapse of the Lehman Brothers uh, and you know, the, the mini bonds that, that were sold. In 2011, the NEMA scheme was expanded to uh, extend to claims up to $3,000, but previously it was only $1,000. And in 2017, our jurisdiction for the general dispute resolution scheme was also expanded to the $100,000 per claim it is today. So those were the key kind of milestones in FIDREC's journey. And earlier I talked about our stakeholders and the importance for everyone's buy-in. These are our key stakeholders. So obviously the Monetary Authority of Singapore is critical because it is them that gives us our teeth, right? Because otherwise um, there's no incentive to be a member of FIDREC. But if you have to be a member of FIDREC, otherwise you cannot be licensed, right? Then that gives us uh, a lot of presence uh, and a lot of say. The financial institutions are very important as well because not only are they our members and hence they fund our operations, they are also repeat players in the system, right? They are the ones who come in for each and every dispute. So we have to work with them, we have to coach them, share our insights with them with the aim, ultimate aim of really reducing the disputes that come through our doors. 
the public, another important stakeholder, and this is where we have to engage the public so that they understand FIDREC's role. Uh, many consumers actually come to us thinking that we should be advocating for them. We should be the ones who are going to the financial institution on their behalf, making the claim for them. And then we have to explain that, no, that is not our role. Uh, we are not a consumer body. We are meant to be a neutral dispute resolution platform. This is sometimes a challenge, as you can imagine, because the consumer, right, as Eric pointed out, will say, well, I'm not equipped to fight against the financial institution. I am but one person against the whole machinery. Um, but then we will just have to encourage them to explain that our entire process, uh, there are no lawyers involved. Everybody gets a fair chance to be heard. And you can still present your case, gather your evidence, put it before the mediator and adjudicator. And, you know, this is a, the way to work your way out of the dispute. Uh, finally, we have adjudicators, the independent adjudicators who we must also manage uh, because we only pay them a small honorarium per case, right? Not comparable to market rate. So we do need their cooperation and their help and support. And finally, our internal stakeholders, all of our staff, whether they are case managers, the frontliners who handle inquiries, they all have to be on board for FIDREC's mission, which is to provide an affordable, amicable dispute resolution scheme. Wangari, I see you've come on. Um, is my time up? No, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, and should I pause for questions at this stage or leave that till later? Uh, I, I, I would suggest that, uh, let's see, um, let me invite uh, Eric, um, if uh, up to this far, there's um, an inquiry, Eric. Uh, probably, uh, Eunice, you may take your screen down. Eric, okay. if you have, yeah, Eric. Uh, that was any, a... Any inquiry or even a general comment? And uh, Eric, from you, what I'm, 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 I'm now listening into is um, from this presentation so far, um, uh, um, as, as you've heard it, uh, are, something, are you hearing some things that look like Kenya or that is, this is Singapore is another place? <laughs> Uh, I, I think I, I think the uh, areas in which we could uh, uh, draw several uh, uh, parallels uh, definitely the uh, areas in which they are much more advanced. They are areas in which we uh, uh, don't have a lot of litigation in this country, but uh, um, it's 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 um. It is well uh, structured, and I think we can borrow a lot from what happens in uh, in, in in Singapore. Uh, it might be as as we we think of how we can develop uh, uh, this, which is a nascent area of practice. Actually, uh, perhaps what we would even call an emerging area of. Uh, practice on mediation. It is something that uh, we, we have, we can borrow a lot from. So I, I wouldn't want to really comment very uh, exhaustively on uh, what has been the presentation by well, that Eunice has given, but I think she's uh, done a very good job in just uh, painting a, a broad overview of what happens in, in, in Singapore. And uh, uh, it, it just tells you that uh, when it comes to mediation, we are barely uh, scratching the surface, that there are countries which are way ahead of us uh, in terms of how they manage uh, uh, um, this. And so always uh, you, you want to lean on the experiences of others. And as I've said, um, I think uh, you to be uh, foolhardy to try and uh, uh, reinvent the wheel when already the, there are people who have uh, demonstrated that uh, the, this model is a model that can can work. So, uh, Yenis, thank you so much. That was uh, for me and and I. And should I say I or mind opening? <laughs> Uh, uh, presentation, but um, uh, 
uh, again, you know, you find sometimes when you occupy some of the positions that we occupy, if you speak so much, then the rest of your members tend to want to say that the chair has spoken for us. So uh, I will uh, just say that that was quite insightful. There are so many areas from which you can borrow on. There are so many opportunities uh, for, for, for us to uh, uh, build on. Uh, so I, I think uh, I'll already be uh, uh, looking forward to what uh, will be discussed after after your presentation and uh, some of the questions that will be asked, and then we will try and see how we can uh, work together to try and make this a reality within the country. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Diplomat Eric Theuri, who is uh, the, <laughs> the chair of the <laughs> Law Society uh, of Kenya, the Nairobi branch. And uh, yeah, yeah uh, yes, Eric, I I really uh, see what you what you're talking about when you say that uh, um, the, um, the, this model this seems like a model that can be uh, borrowed or uh, elements of it and. While still under, while still being very being practical for our, our um, let me say Kenya um, in the areas, but also most of all what I pick also from you, um, um, Eric Theory, is that uh, we have not yet even scratched what mediation can be um, in this particular country, and I think that's a great opportunity of this conversation we are having. So Eunice, kindly, thank you. You may proceed. Okay, so the last part of my presentation is just to share with you some case scenarios um, that I hope can bring to life, um, you know, examples of cases that we handle and, and how they've been worked out. So let me just end off with that. In the first case scenario, I've uh, generated a case study based on uh, a number of real cases, our most common kind of case, uh, market conduct case, right? And here you have um, a lady, Mary, she's an administrative assistant. She's looking forward to retirement in a few years. She's on a shopping trip to the mall. And while she's there, she's approached by a financial advisor. And he tells her that, you know, Mary, you can earn so much better interest if you put your local bank account money into a savings policy that can earn you 3% a year. Um, she heard this advisor say that, you know, she's free to draw or save yearly. And this is for a maximum of 15 years. So very interested by this uh, attractive interest rate, she fills up the financial needs analysis form, which is a requirement in Singapore, um, and proceeds with the purchase. Some months later, when she's talking to a friend, she realizes that this savings policy is actually an insurance plan, and she has to pay monthly premiums of $1,000 right, for the full duration of the policy. Um, now she starts getting worried because she's going to retire soon and she's not sure she can continue with paying the premiums after her retirement. So now there's a dispute. She goes to the financial institution to ask for the policy to be cancelled for her premiums that she has paid to be refunded um, and the financial institution refuses. So this is where the financial institution will refer the customer to FIDREC, right? So under the... Um, arrangement we have with the financial institutions, if there is a dispute that they cannot resolve on their own, they can refer the case to FIDREC. Yeah? So what happens later? Well, at mediation, the financial institution is given a chance to explain to Mary right, what is the process that the regulator requires them to go through, including that, you know, she fill out this form, she has signed these documents, she has signed, you know, an acknowledgement of this purchase. So they, they say that, well, she should have known what she was doing, right? Um, however, right, Mary, you know, explains that, well, I'm really in a fix here, right? Because I have to retire soon. I'm not sure I can continue. I don't want to continue. And if I have to, you know, go into trouble because I can't pay my monthly premiums, why continue with the policy? So during the mediation discussion, you know, various options were discussed. And finally, what was agreed on was for the um, financial institution 
to work with the insurer to restructure Mary's policy to lower the cover and change the duration yeah, so that she will have reduced premiums. So this is one possible scenario and one way that you, know, you can actually achieve a resolution that would not be possible if you go to court, right, where your remedy is usually damages. Okay, we go to the next scenario, which is uh, very common as well, uh, a phishing scam. So this gentleman now, John, he gets his first credit card and he links it to an electronic wallet. And now that's very common for all of us to do, especially in the pandemic where we shop online. So a week later, he gets an email. He thinks it's from the e-wallet provider and it tells him his account has been restricted. He needs to log in and verify it. So not knowing any better, John follows all the instructions, goes to a website, keys in all his credentials, gets a SMS notification with a one-time password right, from the credit card bank saying that you know, your OTP code for the online purchase is you know, 123456. John proceeds to key in this code um, but later realizes that there was a problem because he receives further SMS alerts stating that 1,400 euros has been charged to his credit card by a merchant he doesn't know. Yeah? It is then that he reports to the bank. The bank immediately cancels the card and issues a replacement. Um, the bank also makes a chargeback request on John's behalf. And the chargeback request, of course, is where the bank goes to the merchant, which in this case is dumpster.com, and asks the merchant to give a refund. The merchant refuses in this situation. The chargeback is not successful. So John doesn't want to pay this amount. The bank says, well, John should be responsible. They are at the deadlock. They come to FITREC. So during the mediation, um, you know, various options are discussed once again, right? Uh, the mediator asks John why he keys in this one-time password for online purchase when he's not making an online purchase, right? And then John just explains that, you know, he really thought that it was to remove the restriction on his account. Um, the bank also explains that, you know, as a credit card issuing bank, my role is really just to facilitate payment according to the card terms and conditions. Um, you, you can't expect me to bear you know, losses for this unauthorized transaction, which you had authorized actually because you keyed in the one-time password. Unfortunately, during mediation, there was no resolution. Although the bank made uh, you know, an offer to John to say that you know, um, they will pay 20%, yeah, John refuses. He doesn't want to pay anything at all. And so they go on to the next stage of adjudication. Here, the adjudicator considers, you know, all the submissions, the evidence, and ultimately, he finds that, well, John is at fault because he did key in a one-time password when he was not making an online purchase. And, you know, you should only key in the one-time password code when you are making an online purchase. And he also noted that, um, well, the bank has some fault as well because if the one-time password code um, notification was made clearer, right, rather than say online purchase, what if it said your OTP code for Euro $1,400 purchase from dumpster.com, right, as other banks do. So the adjudicator considered the practice of other banks. Um, he said that that likely would have prevented the fraud from happening as well. So in the end, liability was uh, a portion, 50-50. So each bore 50% of the liability. And my last case scenario uh, is a very topical one. It relates to uh, travel insurance, right? When our travel plans go wrong. So in this scenario, Simon and his wife, they had planned a trip to China, right? In late January. Um, and they purchased air tickets from a budget airline in November. And later they find out that, oh, and they see in the news, there is this outbreak of severe pneumonia cases in Wuhan, China. Um, they don't really bother about this because Wuhan is not on the itinerary. They're going to Beijing, Shanghai, Yunnan. And just before the trip, they buy a single trip travel insurance policy. And very unfortunately, just the next day, um, their budget airline has canceled the flight. Yeah. 
uh, Simon and his wife, like many other consumers at that time, they try and go to the airline, they try and get a refund, they try and go to the hotels, they try and get a refund, um, but there's no response, you know, everybody is kind of swamped, it's unexpected. So Simon does the next best thing, he tries to make a claim against um, the insurance company for the trip cancellation benefit. The insurer rejects the claim because they say that COVID-19 was a known event in late January when Simon uh, purchased the insurance, so they are not covering. Okay, so again, a dispute, no resolution. They come to Fidrec to work it out. Yeah, so you, I mean, all of us here, I think many of us here are mediators, and um, you know, you uh, your mind is probably going, oh, what are some of the possible ways you can mediate this dispute? Well, in this situation, um, the mediator uh, gathered information first and based on this information that she gathered, um, the financial institution accepted that, well, at the time that Simon bought his travel insurance policy, there was a travel advisory by the Singapore government right, against travel to Wuhan, China. But that travel advisory was specific to Wuhan, China. It did not mention other parts of China. And hence, it was reasonable right, for Simon not to have expected that COVID-19 um, would result in all the flights to other parts of China being cancelled at the time. Yeah? Um, Simon and his wife are also an elderly couple. And the insurer accepts that you know, they may not have seen um, their notification on their website to say that COVID-19 will be deemed a known event from XXX date. So after some discussions, um, the insurer finally agrees um, to pay, a, you know, out of goodwill, make a small repayment to Simon and his wife amounting to a total of uh, $100 per person. And this represents a refund of the travel insurance policy premiums uh, minus some nominal deduction for their admin charges. Simon and his wife accept this, right? And the dispute is resolved at mediation. So I hope these three case scenarios give you a flavor of the wide range of cases that we handle and also the wide range of possible solutions. Yep. And with that, um, I will conclude my presentation and I will hand the time back to Wangari to continue uh, with the session. Thank you, Wangari. Yes, that is when we say uh, we say Asante Sana, and uh, I, I'm delighted that uh, even as, uh, as as we go on, uh, we have been we are able now to have uh, we have our colleagues who have joined us uh, from uh, uh, Zach Siengo, who is from uh, Rafiki Microfinance Bank, and uh, also Mr. Patrick Wameo, who is a mentor and also an advisor to uh, Wasiliana Hub, and uh, also he's from the financial uh, industry. Uh, they have been involved with us in uh, as we are, we've been looking at how to develop a strategy for uh, us to be able to uh, engage or uh, let me say like be able to bring out uh, the mediation opportunities that is within the that is within the uh, the the financial industry here in Kenya. Um, I, I'd like to make a request kindly, Eunice. Could you kindly screen this the, the screen the section where you are you are showing the stakeholders. The boxes that have the yes. Okay, let me just uh, go back to that slide. Yes, yes, kindly. Okay. And uh, okay. yes, and yes, and as you're going uh, uh, to that slide, the um, um, I'm also making a request just so that also the colleagues on the call can get uh, just a bit of uh, uh, the picture. So yes, this is the feedback the feedback journey. Yes. So and let's go back. Let's just go back to the feedback journey and then come to here. Come to this particular one. Uh, let me make a request if you could kindly just uh, run through this again and also the stakeholders kindly. Thank you. Okay. So. Earlier, I had shared that Fidrex's journey started before we were formally established in two thousand and five, and that was a key juncture um, because. In order to establish a FITREC, you needed the buy-in of various stakeholders. So we needed um, to be a one-stop dispute resolution center for all financial disputes. We needed the buy-in and agreement of all the different financial sector groups 
the banks, the insurers, life insurers, general insurers, capital market services providers, brokers, independent financial advisors. All these groups were consulted in 2004 um, before um, the sort of a roadmap for FIDREC was drafted and then sent out for public consultation further. Uh, it was only after that that FIDREC was established and the model for this was that the Monetary Authority of Singapore would require all retail financial institutions to be a member of a dispute resolution scheme. And FITREC was the only designated such scheme, such that all financial institution retailers become members of FITREC, they fund our operations, but yet we are still independent from them because we have our own governing board, right, with representatives um, that are mostly independent directors and the financial institutions also in a sense have no real choice about funding us so the consumers can't accuse us of being in their pockets right because the regulatory authority requires them to subscribe to our scheme yeah so this was essentially the model that FIDREC had adopted we chose to be a bit different from the other models in other jurisdictions, the ombudsman model, right, where the ombudsman is empowered by statute to issue certain decisions and to investigate complaints. For us in Singapore, our preference is for more amicable resolution. So FIDREC was not set up as an ombuds office, but rather an alternative dispute resolution institution to offer a mediation service as well as an adjudication service. So although the technically the legislation only came in in 2007 after we were established in 2005, but because all parties had agreed and were on the same page, we could start our work in 2005. Yeah. So I think um, Wangari also wanted to, uh, to explain all the different stakeholders. Um, and this slide captures that. The Monetary Authority of Singapore is Singapore's central bank, and they are key because they give us teeth. Right? And without which we are unable to really enforce uh, our decisions right? and, and have the financial institutions comply with the adjudicator's decisions. The financial institutions are key. Uh, they not only fund our operations, but we also need to work with them so that we can identify you know, all these trends that we see in the complaints coming to us. Are there ways that financial institutions can handle the complaints better on their own right? before they they actually escalate into a dispute. And this is where FIDREC works closely with the financial institutions to share knowledge um, and to add value, right? So that um, we can work towards preventing disputes from arising, right? That is the ultimate goal. For the public, FIDREC has to work closely with the public and other public agencies to make sure that um, the referrals come to us, you know, the right place, right, when there's disputes. And also, um, we also need to play our part to educate the public, share our statistics with them so that there is transparency and accountability. For the adjudicators, I explained just now that our adjudicators are independent from FIDREC. They are not our employees, but rather they are an independent panel appointed by a subcommittee of our board comprising senior lawyers, retired judges, retired industry professionals. And this is important so that we can maintain FIDREC's impartiality and neutrality. And finally, our internal stakeholders, our staff, our board, Right. These are also critical because they have to buy into FIDREC's mission and carry out the mediations and all the work that is needed to handle all the disputes that come in um, from the consumers. Wangari, I hope that summarizes things for you. Yes, yes, greatly. Thank you so much. It also just helped us um, to, uh, the, the, the purpose of this request is uh, was to help us to probably as on our side, Kenya, to get to uh, replay on our side who are these uh, players uh, in Kenya and that's what uh, I would like to uh, invite our uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, firstly I'd like to invite uh, uh, Zach who has joined us Zach Shengo from the Rafiki Microfinance Bank Zach good morning hi hi good morning Good morning, Good morning to you, and yes, welcome. Uh, I will be come. I will be uh, coming to you in uh, in a few minutes. And uh, 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 Eunice Chua has uh, uh, done a replay just to guide us on their side how the how uh, the uh, FIDREC was established, and also who are the stakeholders and who are the players. 
and uh, we'll be coming to you uh, in a short while together with uh, Patrick Omeo. Patrick Omeo, good morning today. Good morning, Patrick. Very well, thank you. Yeah, thank you to thank you for being here. So I'll be coming to yourself and Zach uh, in a short while, and you can probably you can paint for us that this this picture from um, where you come from. Zach being uh, currently um, he's uh, head of uh, marketing and uh, head, of, head of marketing and corporate affairs at uh, Rafiki Microfinance Bank, uh, which is the relationship bank. And specifically, we have been engaging with them because uh, they, they, they are the relationship bank. And so we have been engaging in this dialogue. And Patrick Omeo, uh, who, is, um, uh, uh, as, uh, who will be guiding us uh, as we are closing in terms of, yeah, is this something that Kenya can design and, and how would it look like? Because he's, he has been an industry insider and he's also an insider. Um, he's a founder and chief and, and COO of the Financial Academy and Technologies Limited and a managing consultant and financial educator. So allow me, uh, Eunice Chua, to kindly be able to take any inquiries that are from the colleagues who are on the call. And then we can come now to, uh, we can come to Zach and uh, Patrick Kwameo for their views. Uh, Praxidis, Praxidis, you would like to make a comment, Praxidis? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to make a comment, uh, mainly just to, I'm a certified mediator, but just to appreciate uh, the experience and the legal framework in Singapore. And uh, from that presentation by Chua, uh, it emerged that uh, Kenya has a long way to go in terms of sensitization of uh, members of the public, most especially to understand that not all cases need go to court because mediation uh, and in terms of cost, it's also less. Um, I also uh, realized that um, there's, there's a, a, in terms of uh, the scope, uh, we don't have to go to court in terms of insurance claims, uh, disputes with the bank and stuff like that. And I think this is something we could emulate. Wondering uh, whether a bit better, um, perhaps could handle some of this uh, claim in such a manner. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Praxidis, for your for your comments. Uh, any other colleague with a comment or a, re a reaction uh, to the presentation at this point? Uh, so um, on the group chat, okay, yes, uh, Praxidis, thank you for the presentation and sharing the legal framework in Singapore. Uh, Washika uh, Washira, honorable Washika Washira, greetings, thank chair. You. That was uh, to Eric Theory. Uh, yeah, the great presentation. I concur with your position. And also, thank you, Senior Wangari, for this discussion. It's very educative indeed. Uh, Sabina, uh, yes, glad to be here, Wangari, and colleagues, and thank you for organizing this. So uh, kindly allow me to then now be able to invite uh, Pauline Wahinya, kindly. Pauline Wahinya. Good morning, Wangari. Good morning to you. Welcome. Good. Okay, thank you very much, Eunice, for a beautiful presentation. Uh, that is a great insight. And uh, personally, I'm a banker of many years of standing in this country. And what I can tell the panelists is that many cases of banking industry are even not taken to court because of the reputation. And we don't know how to handle them in most cases, especially the fraud cases with, with cards and all that kind of, and uh, uh, the bad road, which we don't take. So this is a big opportunity, but uh, where I did see you next to telling us whether you have an association. We have Kenya Bankers Association in this country, which is a member of Association of Professionals of our region, the East Africa. So I don't know how you bring this association because you see they have been, they have been uh, driving the, the, the financial industry. So in this case, we have to come as, as the, the last speaker is saying, 
sensitization for the people and, and their association to understand why we are bringing mediation into the table and why it is the best option. Because we, we, we need to, to bring to, uh, to this realization. Because uh, in this country, uh, mediation is a new, it's a new phenomenon. Uh, majority of public and you have brought one of the stakeholders is the public so the public has to understand what is going on like last night in one of my one of my groups somebody was saying there is a default case and they want a lawyer so because of my experience in this week i recommended mediation and people don't want to hear so i was saying i'll give you a mediator who can walk with you before so that we try to save the the marriage and people just ignored but i i'll take i'll take it upon myself and call the person i tell them you before you go to court this can be saved therefore even the names of the institution the name of stakeholders can be you know can be saved therefore i can see where you have arranged the the stakeholders how do you deal with those associations so that they become part and parcel of this uh, journey of mediation in Singapore. That is my comment and my question. Thank you, Angari. Okay. Thank you. So allow me to uh, invite, uh, allow me to invite Eunice to give uh, uh, any reactions to those uh, two, uh, and then we can come now to uh, the uh, Mr. Zach uh, Sengo of uh, Rafiki Microfinance Bank for his uh, remarks. Eh? Kindly, Eunice. Thanks, Wangari, and thank you, Pauline, for that question. Um, you are right that uh, industry associations play a very important role in Singapore as well. So before FIDREC came on board, each industry association uh, had their own kind of dispute resolution scheme. And it was through the agreement of all the industry associations that FIDREC was established as a one-stop center. So regardless of whether it's a banking product, an insurance product, they can all come to FIDREC and all the different institutions will accept FIDREC's jurisdiction to handle these disputes. So ex I think I agree with you, the industry associations are very important. And even today, after FIDREC has been set up for 15 years, I still continue to engage with the industry associations on an annual basis, share with them the statistics annually as regards their particular sector, right? And share with them any insights and also hear from them if they have any issues, any trends they're observing um, so that we can work better with them. And they can then disseminate the information to the wider network of members. So that is also important because as you know, a not-for-profit organization, FIDREC doesn't have a lot of resources to individually reach out to all the 500 over you know, financial institutions who are our members. So we work through the industry associations in that regard. Yes, thank you. So Wangari, I hand it back to you. Okay, great. Um, yes, I think I get what what I get is that the the, the play, players had different, uh, let me say, yeah, platforms for resolving disputes, and then now came together, and then uh, uh, also at the same time, Fedrec has, uh, let me say, has uh, recognition from um, the government authority, which then at the same time also acceptance from what you call the industry, um, the industry itself. Okay. So kindly allow me to invite uh, Mr. Zach Siengo from Rafiki Microfinance Bank to kindly give us his remarks. Uh, Mr. Mr. Zach Siengo, we, in, we have invited him um, earlier in the year today, the, earlier in, the, in this year, when we were having one of our discussions and uh, the, we were trying to understand how the uh, banking industry works. And we really are really grateful that he helped us to understand that. Uh, Mr. Zach Siengo, please proceed for your remarks. All right. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me once again. Um, I think for me, well, first I would like to, to apologize. I joined here a little bit late because of another meeting. But um, at the point where I joined in, I have just listened to the presentation. And um, I actually feel, obviously, Singapore being a, an advanced uh, financial system, is, is quite advanced in this um, uh, this field, especially on mediation. 
And uh, I appreciate the role of uh, Fidrek. And I'm just thinking here, this is something that we need to embrace and think through. How do we establish something close uh, to that um, here in Kenya? Um, uh, so just thinking through, uh, two things come into mind. One is there is need for collaboration and someone mentioned about associations like the Kenya Bank, the Association of Microfinance Institutions to assist in terms of setting up um, 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 to assist in setting up something that is widely accepted banking. And I can imagine even uh, on some courage, obviously the, the, you know, the legal framework in terms of going to court, but mediation really has not been uh, made very, um, a, an area of focus here in Kenya to save cost, to, take, to save time. So my encouragement would be that in terms of the strategy, how do we ensure that mediation is, is taken as one of the you know, best avenues in the country through training and awareness? And this obviously will need, again, going back to the collaborative um, efforts and ability of putting it together, ensuring everyone is on board, especially the stakeholders that you feel have the highest impact. So those would be my comments for now, Wangari. Thank you, thank you very much, Zach. Allow me to kindly invite uh, Mr. Uh, our, our, uh, Mr. Patrick Wamel to um, highlight to us uh, from his experiences, uh, and uh, he's from uh, Financial Academy and Technologies Limited, so he can kindly uh, let us know what his views are based on this discussion. Karibu sana, Mr. Patrick Wamel. Thank you. Sorry, Wangari, I came in a little late. I tried for a very long time to join, but I couldn't. You, you have arrived home, welcome. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the subject of mediation in the banking sector is not a new topic. It's, it's a topic I can tell you was on the tables when I was 27 years old. That's slightly over 26 years today, 24 years today. And it is actually required. I think what you have to do is to create a compelling value proposition. The problem has gotten worse uh, from what we were dealing with in 1995, 96, 97, when we're moving from a manual banking system to an automated banking system. Now we are moving from automated digital and the number of people included today, uh, what you call the level of financial inclusion has really grown. So as much as the Kenya Bankers Association, the Association of Microfinance Institutions and the Association of Kenya Insurers um, have for a long time been offering some role um, what I would call an intermediate role dealing with some of the issues. One, there's no clear framework. Uh, number two, there's no ownership. And let's just be honest. I had a chance to work in Singapore when I was a lot younger. And the level of customer service in Singapore is way, way high. Way high compared to even the present level of customer service in Kenya. So definitely the number of issues that are arising from mistakes in banking transactions or banking equivalent transactions are very high there. I've personally gone through one with a very reputable bank in the last one month. Or rather, let's just call it last three months. And if I didn't know my way around, I would have gotten a very good solution. Uh, done. So the question of one, the need, that's definite. The question now is how do we go in 
um, long term, like Eunice mentioned, you will need a legal, a legal position. Um, in law, in Kenya, law always follows policy. So someone has to revise a policy that can inform that law. And that might take you very long if you do not appreciate the path to follow. I am of the view that the first place to go is Central Bank. The current CBK governor is quite sober and perhaps would appreciate the place of mediation faster than all the other um, the all the other players, their colleagues, the holders. The Association of Kenya Insurance, the Kenya Bankers Association, and the Association of Microfinance Institutions have legacy issues. Um, they will not be the fastest people to adopt a good idea. But they need to be pulled in by a, a central force, which if you ask me, I think you'll get from central bank. In any case, the banks and microfinance, uh, in microfinance banks that are now not uh, just the other set of microfinance are under central bank. And the central bank governor is also the patron of financial literacy. So he's in such an, an unusual position to push for policy change um, so that that policy can then inform legislation. And he's also in a very unusual position to perhaps attract the interest of these other associations to be able to create the equivalent of the Zitfindrek in, in Singapore. But that is something we needed here in 19, 95, 94, not today. Uh, today is actually long overdue. There is no, the, we have had the office of Ombudsman, but the office of the Ombudsman that we have had is not the banking Ombudsman, is not the insurance Ombudsman. Utiende Amola, who has been the Ombudsman, is more of um, the legal side of issues. Just in case you need that support, Utiende was my classmate, I can get it, get it to you. We talk to him, they just find out what can be organized. But the real thing is to try to get the CBK, get to the CBK governor's office, present a strong case, a very well thought through value proposition. And I think uh, you will get your way. It will be long, but you will finally get there. I was reading something in the this morning about this gentleman who wants to go to, to the to mass, and he says, "I will never stop." And I think that's that, that's that's the mood. You will never stop once you adopt it. You probably just break it 10, 15 years from now, maybe five, maybe two. Yeah. That's Thank nice you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mentor uh, Patrick Wameo, for your uh, contributions to the discussion. And uh, I'd like to invite, I'd like to invite Eunice for your your comments uh, based on uh, what has been uh, raised, because I, I I may suspect that uh, some of the things that have been raised you also uh, either dealt with them uh, in uh, in uh, in Singapore or at uh, dealing with some of the areas, or you could have some uh, views. Yes. Thank you. Welcome, Eunice. So I'd like to thank everyone for sharing their comments and this gives me a better insight into you know the situation that uh, you know you are all working in in, in Kenya and um, I would say that Singapore is quite unique because uh, we are quite a compliant uh, country <laughs> generally we are small um, and our government is um, you know it has the trust of the people right? And that is the starting point uh, that gives the our central bank, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, that authority, that status uh, in the minds of people, right? Not just a legal status, but a real, you know, psychological buy-in um, to be able to lead this uh, integration of all our separate, you know, financial sector dispute resolution bodies into one body, which is FIDREC today. So I, I do think 
I mean, I, I agree with, with, with Patrick's thought that, you know, the central bank would be a good place to start, yeah, because they have overall authority over the financial institutions. Um, but then, of course, uh, if, if Kenya is anything like Singapore, uh, you have to kind of do it both ways, right? Because people don't like top down, right? It has to also be consultative um, and there has to be an opportunity for the different industry associations, right? whether it's the banking association, the um, you know, microfinance and so on, to be able to give their input. Right. So in Singapore, this took the form of a consultation, a public consultation process. So after um, MES formed this um, committee with representatives from each of the industry associations and from consumer associations, um, they designed the framework for FIDREC and they put it out there for public consultation right, to give everybody a chance to kind of give their comments before they issued a formal response addressing all the points that were raised. So, I mean, this public consultation is the reason why there's some of these unique features about FIDREC. So one unique feature that is not in other jurisdictions is, you know, for other ombudsman, financial ombudsman institutions, the ombudsman decision will be given, a copy of the decision is given to the parties. Um, but in Singapore, we don't do that. Rather, um, when we get the decision, we will read it out to the parties without extending them a copy. And this was the reason, this was actually from the public consultation process, where the banks and the you know insurance associations were actually very concerned that if you publish these decisions, Singapore being a small community, you know the people could be identified, which would um, have reputational issues. They were also concerned that the public would shape their behaviour based on the published cases so that they can, you know, fabricate um, the facts such that they are able to tailor their evidence um, in a way that will match an earlier case. So that is why it's rather unique in Singapore where we don't actually give a copy of the decision, we just read it out. So I guess this was the outcome. It was like a compromise between the different institutions, the consumer associations. So for Kenya, you'll have to walk your own journey and find those um, compromises that matter. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. That is quite an uh, interesting. Um, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm also hearing a strategy there because uh, public participation. So perhaps the question that we have for today is a question that can be uh, made as a public question to be, I mean, together with the stakeholders. Because the, the, the question that we have today is, is Kenya ready for an industry independent financial industry dispute resolution center? So possibly that's um, a route that it uh, that we can be able to take, and it's also quite interesting that you raise that. Uh, then there was a point of compromise, and uh, because what I'm hearing from you is that um, a, a copy of the decision is not necessarily given, and the intention here was so that it's not circulating all over. Um, and I can imagine that time social media was not what it is today. So uh, yet again, and uh, again, so even with now the developments as um, uh, Patrick Omeo has raised that. Yes, we, the, the banks were in the manual system or institutions, they went automation and then now the, the digitization, all these are making the, I mean, the communication much, much more open by, by default, what it means for uh, reputation. So allow me to kindly invite uh, uh, mediator Sabina Muticia. Mediator Sabina Muticia. Good morning to you. Sabina Muticia. Mute. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Uh, Andy, yes, yeah, for your remarks. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what I would like to say is that this session has been very creative and I think it's possible. I think we can make it. I can, I think I would say we are ready, but we need to be, we are ready, but we need to start to do something. Yeah? We need to come together, make an organization that will be able to meet the needs that are there because it is evident that the, meet, the needs are there in the society, in our country, from what I've heard. But then from what we learned from UNIS, the way they started in, was it 2015 or 2005? I can't remember now. It is possible for us to begin. And since now we are informed and the needs are there and it's quite clear we sh might be able to come up with something within a shorter time, 
again, if people are willing to compromise before, because we have different bodies and different bodies have their own views and the way they would want to do things. Therefore, the aspect of comprom compromise will be very important for us, but it's possible and I think we can do it. And thank you very much for the presenters and all those who have participated. It is very enriching and it gives a lot of hope. I think we can do it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mediator Sabina Muticia. Um, you, you raise a very um, uh, important uh, point that uh, uh, there are various uh, players and it, it probably means that they need to be able to um, align. And uh, that's where you're now saying about uh, compromising. And if I may kindly uh, uh, just have a, a comment from Zach with regard to uh, when you look at the Kenyan financial industry sector, uh, are there areas where we can say that uh, the, let me say like the, the providers, because we have the providers, the consumers are also stakeholders, the providers and their respective consumers, are there areas where they have interests together? So for example, when you talk about like the banking industry, we talk about insurance, we have the stock exchange. Are we able to say there's an area where they can be, we can say that their interests, uh, let's say can converge because uh, 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 mentor Patrick Wameo talked about you need to have a value proposition. Yes, please, Zach. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if I look at most of the disputes that arise uh, within, the, within the industry, the biggest issue is the cost, the cost of the whole process of resolution and, uh, and the cost of the um, the cost of, of, of time, because it takes time to solve some of these matters. So that would be a central point that creates um, a value proposition that you can actually share with anyone who is in the financial sector, be it be capital markets, uh, insurance or banking sector. And by the end of the day, everybody looks at it, that it adds value to their business. So I think that's, that's a- Okay common points that could be quite valuable to that we can ride on okay okay yeah thank you zach uh yes yeah, so from zach uh he, he talks about um there there are two areas that could be yeah, part of the of the value part of the value proposition with regard to the um, uh, uh the aspect of uh, costs and also the aspect of time uh mentor patrick Pomeo, how would we phrase this you know so that it's understandable because in different places, when, when you talk about cost, they are in different industries, they understand, they understand it differently. There are some sectors where probably they want the cost to be much higher so that uh, they, you know, the, the cost is much higher because they are bottom line it shows that probably uh, the business is not doing as well as probably it should or time maybe may, may not be an issue in this industry or another industry. Yes, kindly mentor Patrick Omeo. I had a chance to be an employee in banks and insurance. Yes. And I have spent the last 12 years consulting for the circles sector specifically and banks. The challenge, if you look at it, when, when, you're, when you're preparing a value proposition, the key thing is what's the depth of the problem to who? Yes. If you ask me, as I mentioned earlier, in the last 10, 11 years, there's been a very huge effort to increase what you call inclusion. So today, we have a very huge number of people who are included in the financial services, in banks, in insurance, uh, in generally the credit space, the consumption of credit, and Kenya, historically, and until yesterday midnight, unless something changed today, mm. we allow things to, to run fast, then we go back and regulate. So for example, we've had 55 licensed providers of, um, of um, app-based lending who have not been operating at the level that banks expect, I mean, the central bank expect banks to operate with, this, with respect to information. So 
if you have a problem with your app-based lender, you have no one to run to except the code. And look at the number of people who have borrowed from apps in the last one year. Mm. Discussing 17, 18 million people who are formerly outside the financial services sector one year ago. Mm. So we're discussing a much bigger market and needs mm. and challenges that we might not be able to exhaust on this screen uh, in these 15 minutes. But I'll tell you the following. Number one, mm -hmm. access to that service, be it what a court would have, would have done, which is what mediation would do. Mediation is likely to give someone more access to a person who is a lot easier to find online or otherwise. Today, if you have a problem with, with an insurance company, you have to write a letter to the association or something, and then it takes them a month or two to come back to you. So just that speed of getting things done is itself a cost, more than the financial element of the cost. When, when you're talking about mediation as a solution, it is not mediation as an alternative solution. It is mediation as the solution and the courts as the alternative solution. Because mediation do have the potential of becoming the solution. You can have mediators located anywhere in the 47 counties. You can go down deeper inside those counties and get mediators. You will find them. It is more difficult to come to Nairobi to complain or except to go to your local court. A lot of us in the villages don't have the financial muscle to even file a case in court, leave alone the, the ignorance that would let them do it. So it is easier to actually lower the cost of accessing a dispute resolution service where the cost is more of time and inconvenience before you speak financial. And then financial becomes the second level of cost. So if you ask me the opportunity for alternative dispute resolution today to lower the actual cost of poor service in this industry is what will be the most compelling element of that value proposition, both to the financial institutions, to their associations, and to their five regulators. I've just added uh, in, in, on, on, on the WhatsApp message there, you've not mentioned the Benefits Authority, the RBA. You've not mentioned Sasra and Cusco for the SACOs. Today, SACOs are the largest financial services provider followed by microfinance. It's not banks. It is not. I, I work with them, I can tell you. SACOs are the largest services provider to the people who otherwise are, are the majority. And those are the people who, who lack the opportunity to know who to go to. If, if you cost me trouble, I know who to go to and, I, and I, can, I can call my lawyer, I, can, I know who to go to. And there are people who don't know who to go to. And, and they are the people for whom mediation serve the first purpose. And they are the largest number. In, in that pyramid at the bottom, the largest number sit there. So that person, to him, the largest, the single most significant cost is access, then financial. Of course, uh, you can remove ignorance by way of um, by way of uh, creating awareness. But even that awareness needs to be delivered in a manner that it reaches the people as conveniently as possible. Through the same same process, we are using to increase inclusion. I, I, we are not we are talking about those as many of the issues that customers have with the institution can have an alternative distribution. And it can be done very fast. Yeah. I think if you ask me, that's what I would say for now. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. You, you. you actually have taken the, 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 the context of the value proposition and been able to tie in when we talk about that the value proposition is because of uh, costs and time, you have put it together 
in what is, I think, a very important thing that's access. And that continues to be a very, very important message um, um, in this side and tying it to the conversation on uh, financial inclusion, which is actually a, is, is a global agenda. And when you talk about financial inclusion, we even now bring in um, very unique stakeholder groups, um, young people, uh, women. Uh, if you have a young person who just uh, turned 18 and so they open their bank account as now they're going to the university, because when you're going now to the university, you are probably receiving um, um, a loan from the uh, higher education's loans board. And then now you have a dispute with your banker or um, a, uh, any of the players. Um, I think then if the mediation is an option, then it probably means, and possibly a model like uh, Fidric, then it means a young person like that then can be able to, act, to access that service and still continue to be part of the financial system without having now to be excluded because uh, uh, at this juncture, you've also raised the issue of um, the, uh, the digital apps, financial service providers, and we have the credit referencing bureau where uh, I, I think that is also now going to be another very uh, big area very soon because uh, we've had a lot of borrowing and in, uh, by persons from multiple uh, providers and the, the threat is of being listed with the credit reference bureau um, uh, at, at some point. So allow me at this juncture to be able to, uh, uh, just before I invite uh, my mediator, uh, Phyllis Wangwe for, for her comments, I see that uh, Mary Otieno has said, yes, it's a great presentation and Kenya is headed in the, in, in the right uh, direction. So mediator Phyllis Wangwe, good morning to you today. Uh, good morning. Good morning to you. Yes, I, I'm sorry I've come in, I've, I've come in late, but uh, yes. maybe I'll just comment on uh, briefly, maybe just, just to confirm, uh, I've seen uh, the, a, a comment from Fidric, and I'd just like a confirmation of wh what kind of disputes do they deal with? Okay. It may have been presented and I didn't hear, maybe if I can get a response to that, then maybe I, I can continue. Okay. okay. So um, yeah, yeah, okay, that's okay, yeah, Eunice. Um, allow me then to invite Eunice first. Then Eunice, you may kindly uh, just, uh, from the discussion that has uh, uh, we've had, uh, Zach has given um, his views with regard to the value proposition um, and also Patrick Kwameo, and uh, we also had Sabina Muticia from those comments. And then uh, you will, in that conversation, be able to now just refresh us on the sort of disputes that you, you deal with, just for a refresher. Eunice, kindly. Fidric, we handle disputes between consumers who are individuals or sole proprietors with their financial institutions arising from their customer relationship with the institution. Um, under our terms of reference, um, the financial institutions are any sort of institution that is a, has a retail license with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. They include banks, finance companies, general insurers, life insurers, capital market services licensees, brokers, individual advisors, and so on. So we handle the full spectrum of um, financial institutions. Um, and the kinds of disputes we handle uh, range from market conduct disputes, where the allegation is some sort of misrepresentation, mis-selling, or inadequate disclosure relating to a financial product, as well as uh, disputes on liability, uh, whether or not a claim should be paid out, whether or not this uh, policy the financial institution has towards paying of claims uh, is justified or not. These are our two big types of claims. Um, and as to the most common product group, uh, this would be life insurance. We, this is the biggest um, group of products that we handle, followed by consumer personal finance products, which include credit cards, debit cards, and your savings accounts, current accounts. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Phyllis, any, any comments? Uh, that's any okay. one way. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Eunice. Actually, I think at some point, Wameo and I have communicated on different forums on financial literacy and that, and I really like his articulation on what he has said and what the, what the industry needs. For real, I feel just as uh, they have commented and the, the, the small part that I've caught, there is a gap. 
yes, we do have the Kenya Credit Providers Association, but you see, Kenya Credit Providers Association actually just tends to deal with the banks and beliefs exclusively. I don't think they've been able to lead the other uh, industry players. And if they have, then people are not aware. So the emphasis that he has put on access is very critical. The element of financial inclusion and so that they can know where to go to is lacking. And what I know from experience, and I think then we also have a lot of work and probably we, we can sit down and come up with that value proposition uh, um, based on, the, on, on my experience also in the banking sector because uh, I worked with Stanchart and NBK. Um, sometimes the customers are even intimidated. You know, they come and they can't even understand what is being presented before them. So it is very good. I think time is ripe for us to have a, an outfit like this, financial industry dispute resolution. And it will actually be very helpful to all, most members of the society. Much now as we are, in, we, we are, we are trying to come up with this financial inclusion and the mamambogas and all that, where do they go to when there's a dispute? Where do they go to when there's a dispute? Because even when I was working in the bank, sometimes I'd see some of my fellow, fellow, fellow staff being very rude to customers. And where would the customer go? Sometimes they can't even write and even put in the suggestion box. Or sometimes even if they put in the suggestion box, the person you're complaining about is the same person who is going to pick the document from the suggestion box. And as you can imagine, probably it will not see the light of day. So for me, I, I feel it's really, really time that we went out for this. And um, I think we can sit down with Wangari and Wame and everybody else to come up with a value proposition and actually see what kind of structure would work in Kenya. Because I, I believe there is, um, there is need for this. There is need for this. And thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, thank you for that. Um, allow me to kindly invite uh, Mediator Bernard Rotich, who's on the call. But, uh, Mediator Bernard Rotich. We can have your views and then uh, we will do a, 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 round, a roundup. I will go, kindly go back to uh, Zach, uh, Zach Siengo if he has um, any, um, for any additional comments to wrap up. Uh, Zach Siengo is the head of marketing and corporate affairs at Trafiki Microfinance Bank, uh, the Relationship Bank. We engaged, uh, we invited Zach to speak to us as we've been developing our financial industry strategy and he shared with us generally how the industry sits. And also, we will also invite uh, Mr. Patrick Romeo of Financial Academy and Technologies uh, to, and also he's a, a management consultant and financial educator to just give us his wrapping views. And then we can now be able to conclude with uh, Eunice. So welcome, Bernard, kindly. Bernard, good Okay, morning. thank you so much, Wangari. Very well, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. I want to thank Eunice because of the presentation, which was good. I want to say that this is coming at the time when the mediation in Kenya is taking root. Uh, it's giving us an opportunity to explore the various models which we can be able to borrow and uh, customize into our situation in Kenya. Uh, I want to say that uh, as a uh, Sorry, there was an interruption in the signal. Hello. So as I was saying, is that uh, we can be able to borrow a lot from what is happening in Singapore, can be able to have several models and put it into our situation. I think it was a very nice presentation and we have a lot to learn from, from that. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard, for your for your remarks. Allow me to kindly now invite. Wangari, I think you went on mute. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you Nis, for that a lot. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you for your comments, uh, mediator Bernard Rotich. We kindly will now invite uh, Mr. Zach Chengo to kindly give us his uh, closing views and 
the question that we are still asking is Kenya ready for an industry independent financial industry dispute resolution center? And uh, we are delighted that Mr. Zach Chengo, you were able to join us for this um, open conversation. Karibu, Zach. Zach, Karibu. Hello, Zach. Okay. Uh, before Zach can uh, give us uh, his comments, could I kindly then invite Mr. Wameo? I might not be able to have a lot more to say, except okay. just to wrap up by saying that uh, the issue of getting the present stakeholders key there are more stakeholders, the key stakeholders to appreciate the place for a centralized resolution center, uh, perhaps centralized and also decentralized, centralized in the sense that we are using mediation, but the very fact that those mediators are everywhere in Kenya is yeah. decentralizing a centralized service will perhaps be quite a solution. And I, I I made my case, let me just summarize it. Any one of the recent lenders that have joined in via apps, based lending from CBA to KCB, are doing an average of 400,000 loans a day. Um, and there are approximately 55 apps. My last record as at June this year, I've not checked was joined after June. Again, doing another 15, 20,000 loans each. You're talking about the number of people who are now participating actively in the financial services sector in the credit space only, having grown sevenfold. Insurance is still struggling with growth, but has plenty of challenges with their policies, um, particularly because, and I'm gonna say this on record, we have slightly over 19,000 insurance agents in the industry, whom I regret to say are not qualified to be called financial advisors, they are salesmen. So there are, a lot of, there are a lot of conflicts between what I wanted and what I eventually bought, and which you only realize 13, 15 years later, or when you are losing your job and you go check with the insurance company, what kind of policy uh, you bought and you realize what you were told you bought and what you actually are carrying uh, are different things. So the, the challenge on Gary is that huge, it's as huge as all the ills in the RBA area of pension funds. There are a lot of pension fund complaints. There are a lot of insurance complaints. There are a lot of banking transaction complaints. Forget about credit, just transactions. There are lots of higher education loans board complaints I've personally suffered in the hands of help one of my former colleagues in high school was in my office last month suing him for 18 million shillings for perpetually sending him a debt collectors when he cleared the debt when he was 20, 29. He's now 49, 20 years later. We are discussing real issues. So the, 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 the magnitude is getting worse by the quantitative growth in inclusion. So there's no question of, is this service needed? The issue is, how will we structure to enter and to start doing something? You might not need to wait for legislation to come, but you have to start chasing legislation to come. And, and as, as I mentioned to you, legislation in Kenya starts the policy. So get the policy on a central bank to own the policy in the space. And then you 
you proceed by building capacity of mediators on the ground. Because it's one thing saying we want to do it, but how many mediators do we also have on the ground to deliver this service? If I go to Kisumu, how many mediators are there? So that you need, you need to be seen to be doing something before you arrive at the place where now you're saying, can we now be this central mediation body? You need to be felt in the space as it were today. You, the insurance industry itself need to feel you. The banking industry need to feel you. The microfinance sector need to feel you. The circle sector, there are a lot of issues need to feel you. Um, mention any key element of the financial services sector. There are complaints. And because I consult with them on a daily basis, I shut my mouth. But I'll tell you, there are enough, enough issues. Walk into any member's education day in a circle, and you, someone is discussing a complaint that ought to be discussed with the business office, the branch, but is bringing it to the member's education day. That level of ignorance can be reduced if there was somebody else to offer that alternative education. That alternative ed education is part of solving the problem. So that the right complaints are taken to the right level. They don't go, you don't, you don't carry a complaint for a year when you ought to have taken it somewhere. And, and as uh, uh, Phyllis mentioned, the other issue is that no one is listening to you, perhaps, where you should be listened to. So if there is an alternative voice, then you, you put pressure on the people who ought to listen to start listening. That's my plea. And I think that is all I will tell you for now. I think the only other time I'll be able to participate is when you need me okay. to contribute to a significant value proposition. Thank you. Okay, okay, wonderful. I think that that's already a great, um, um, let me say, invitation that uh, as we have we have received from uh, um, our mentor, uh, Patrick Pameo, which I am sure we will be taking up when we are uh, uh, looking at how to put together our value proposition. Uh, Zach, are you able to speak now so that we can get your closing remarks and then we can hear from Eunice? So the, the, the process that we are in during this uh, African International Mediation Week is we have discussions in, in segments of or sectors that we view as uh, uh, the Wasilian Hub community are areas that mediation can add value uh, in the area of family <coughs> mediation in the area of commercial extractives, a financial industry, which is what we are discussing um, um, here today. And th in these particular areas, we've had general discussions. And then on Friday, we will be consolidating um, what we have heard, what we have learned. And so from each of these discussions, we are picking out what are key things, and then we can be able to develop a tactical way to move together as a community of mediators. Uh, Mr. Patrick Amaya, we have a comment before Zach and I just wanted to mention yes, that please. Singapore has the best index on corruption. Uh -huh. The best, and Kenya has the worst. We are in number, the last 17. So the, 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 the level of issues that we will be dealing with that arise from that vice that require to be listened to are quite a bit. And that does enhance the case. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ameo. You you bring out um, the, the context that we, we, we would not just be looking at things on face value. There's also other things that may be um, 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 not so on face value. And Eunice, kindly, when you comment, you will also let us know in terms of how you also handle uh, like uh, such matters or how we could probably approach. Zach, may, if I may kindly, Zach? Yeah, um, my final comments would be there is a lot, what they would want to, to see is the value that, um, the value that mediation brings. And, and obviously we all agree in this forum that um, mediation has a lot of value uh, and, and a number of aspects have been discussed. 
Now, the biggest challenge for, for the actors um, is to, to, package, to package that value proposition and, um, and, and you know, share it with the industry, industries that, that, um, that we are looking at. And that forms the basis of starting this conversation and making it work. So that, that would be my only challenge um, I would like to pass, pass to, to the actors. Thank you. Thank you, Zach, for your comments, which is uh, you take us back to the aspect of value uh, proposition and you indicate that uh, <clears throat> that is what would now be brought now to the, uh, to the, to the stakeholders in the industry by the actors. Um, I wish to point out that uh, where, uh, um, uh, so in the opening remarks, the, uh, the chair of the Law Society of Kenya, the Nairobi branch, he indicated that uh, it's important that we are able to uh, understand let me say this industry, when you say is Kenya ready for an industry uh, independent financial industry dispute resolution center. So who are this uh, we are talking about? And I think Zach, you've um, alluded to that. And then also um, um, at the same time, um, he also raised that uh, uh, the, the more Kenya becomes an attractive place for business to be done, then uh, uh, being a, a, a body that uh, is keen on unlocking opportunities for their members to be able to do to get business, then the more Kenya becomes a place that's attractive for business, then also it also means more business opportunities for their own members, and uh, that uh, mediation is one of the ways that is, is that can be used to unlock new opportunities um, for business. So with those comments, I think uh, we then are able to say that uh, a key, I think, a key takeaway from this conversation is the context of value proposition. So. On, on Friday mediators, when we are now sitting to say, what is our way forward? How do we move forward? I think this is one of the key takeaways and the others we can be able to um, uh, uh, discuss as, as we do go on. So I'd like to thank uh, Zach and, uh, um, and also Mr. Wameo for their remarks and uh, invite Eunice Chua kindly. Eunice Chua is the, the, the chief executive officer of the financial industry, dispute resolution center that is Feedrek in Singapore. Uh, having been our international speaker for today, Eunice, you've done a great job for us to open us up and see that this is happening somewhere. So kindly, Eunice, your closing remarks as you also react to anything that has been said. Thank you. Thank you, Wangari, and uh, everybody who has participated and commented. I, I really do appreciate hearing from all your perspectives. Um, I think I'll just end with two, two points. Um, the first point is uh, essentially trust. And I think as mediators, we understand that trust underpins the success of individual mediations. But also, if you want to be a successful mediation institution, um, you do need to have the, the trust of the people so that they will come to you for the disputes to be resolved. So I think uh, Mr. Wameo, he mentioned that um, that might be challenging in, in Kenya's context where, um, you know, he pointed out the corruption index uh, statistic. Well, I think then that might be a reason to, you know, examine the model to adopt, right? Whether you want to adopt an ombudsman type of model or a more ground up, a private not-for-profit organization type of model, right? So this would be something for, for you to discuss. And the second point about the value proposition, um, I'll just share um, some thoughts based on what we have seen that our financial institution members most appreciate about FIDREC. So the first is um, they appreciate that where they have run out, uh, they, they, they are able to handle a complaint for a month and thereafter refer it to FIDREC, right? Because having to deal with persistent complainants is taxing on the resources of a, of a financial institution. It is a cost center, doesn't generate uh, revenue, right? So they do appreciate that uh, where they have they're given a chance to handle the complaint, but if they are not successful within a certain period of time, they can then refer the customer away to an independent um, institution. Um, the second value proposition that I think um, emerges is the cost value, right? And we find that um, although for adjudications, we have a limit of $100,000, increasingly our financial institution members are coming to us to handle mediations with knowing that they cannot bring it on to adjudication because the value is too high. So this would be millions of Singapore dollars. But they do appreciate that we are very cost-effective avenue 
um, so that they will want to come to us to try and resolve their disputes um, before going to court or even after having gone to court um, in Singapore the model is uh, very much to promote alternative dispute resolution so your um, assistant registrar or magistrate will ask you whether you've attempted mediation before and if you know, give you an opportunity to do that, they might come to us at that stage um, as well. So I think those are the two contributions I wanted to end off with um, before thanking everybody for this opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Thank you. Uh, Eunice, once again, I really say thank you on behalf of uh, the Wasilian Hub community and also on behalf of the other partners who have joined us in this conversation and also for those who will be able um, to, uh, to listen in. I also wish to thank the colleagues who are on the call and also this uh, is a recorded call and so we will be sharing it. We will be sharing it um, out and I'm delighted that uh, Mr. Patrick Romeo and also Mr. Zach Sengo have, they, it's like they've helped us to just get, you know, this very big conversation and brought us into, you know, like bringing you into now where a, 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 a convergence that can help us to know um, how to move, to move forward. So I thank you, Zach Yango, for your uh, kind support and contributions, and also Mr. Patrick Romeo. Um, so we have uh, uh, remarks uh, that uh, yes, cost effectiveness is is, is uh, cost effectiveness is an attractive um, aspect uh, from Sabina, and uh, also uh, we we see our remarks that say thank you for uh, this particular time. And so at this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to make a request that we can be able to close this conversation. And uh, Eunice, I think this is the beginning of this conversation, not the end. Mr. Patrick Pameo, this is as a mentor to, uh, to us, this is a beginning of this conversation. You've opened the value proposition uh, journey. And also for Mr. Zach Chengo, we are still coming back to you. So colleagues, thank you. I wish you to have a very, very good day. We will end with the words of the National Anthem and then Eunice, you may kindly close uh, this session for us. So the words of the National Anthem in Ke from Kenya in Kiswahili, Wimbo wa Taifa, the first stanza. E mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwe ngao, iwe na wakati, na tukai na wakati, amani na ustawi, na hatu pate na ustawi. I wish to thank you and have a blessed the rest of the day. See you at 11.30. At 11.30, we have a discussion today on uh, uh, why there should be no ground rules in the mediation chambers. We will be led by Ms. Mary Anyango Tieno, who's a clinical psychologist and a trained mediator. She is a student counselor and dean of, uh, in the Dean of Students Department at the University of Nairobi in Kenya, uh, in Kisumu. And in the evening, the next session will be in the evening at 8 p.m. At 8 p.m., you want to be there as long as you're a mediator. We will be hosting uh, Mediate BC uh, from British Columbia. Uh, that's in Vancouver, Canada. They will be taking us through how to uh, be, how to have collaboration and practitioner organizations, that societies and associations, so that you can have a thriving uh, society or association um, here in Kenya. So God bless you. Eunice Chua, you may close us now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Asante. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.